did you become interested in gerontology? Well, when I was young, 17, I wanted to be a nurse and I wanted to help people. And uh, in the nursing program, this was Highland School of Nursing in Oakland, California, I found that physically helping people um, with specifically health problems wasn't um, my calling. I, I knew I had a broader kind of psychosocial, I didn't know those words then, but you know, a, a, a broader way of relating to them as uh, human beings and, and their situations around health, but not specifically focused on the medical. Mm -hmm. And it just came to me at that time, really very young. I know people come into the field much later, but it was, uh, I was about 17 years old. And it just, I was walking down the streets of Oakland and <laughs> it came to me that working with older people. I mean, and then I explored that from there and, and I haven't flinched in that dedication since. You know, it's been uh, interesting that I would actually call it a calling, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't accidentally bump into it, I was kind of just on this path. Wonderful. Can you describe your career trajectory as a gerontologist and at what point in your career did you embrace gerontologist to describe yourself? Ooh, okay. Um, well, it was um, after I finished a baccalaureate degree in something called American Studies and Sociology, so I was kind of on that path after nursing, and uh, had a couple kids, and um, then decided to go on for my master's, and that's, so that's when I entered in specific gerontology degree program in, within the Cal State system. And so I think really it was at that point, though so I had this interest earlier and um, took classes that related to the social issues of older people and so forth within the baccalaureate program that it was at the master's degree that mm -hmm. I got the gerontology into my uh, system as who I was, what my professional persona was. Um, and then I went on. <laughs> what, what <laughs> then I went on then? after that <laughs> um, and um, worked for a while as a gerontologist. And quite honestly, uh, since students and other people, will be, you know, and this is I think some of the uh, progress we need to make in the field, that gerontologists, you know, this was probably late 70s, um, weren't really recognized. And I would apply for jobs, and I remember I got one job uh, with LA, not LA, uh, Riverside County Mental Health to develop services for older adults. And they had to change their job description to let me in as a gerontologist. You know, so I recognized that I had to particularly sell myself as a gerontologist to um, do the kind of work I wanted to do. So, um, but I did. I, I worked for Riverside County for about a decade and um, they had some very good services for older people in a rural area and so that was an accomplishment but I decided then after about that um, decade or 12 years or so um, going back to school. Mm -hmm. So when I went back to school at UCLA and I got and had as an aim both my MSW, which was the requirement for most of the jobs that I had been applying for, um, and so I had my MA in gerontology and my I was getting my MSW and then I got my PhD very specifically focused on um, older adults and policy issues related to health and education, particularly education um, and um, the way in which older adults were covered uh, in schools of social work. And so um, from there on then my career led to more academic and practice. It was always academic and practice and I became the associate director of the Geriatric Research Education Center, the GRAC at the Veterans Administration and very affiliated with the Geriatric Education Centers both at USC and at UCLA. And that was my career. It was focused on the relationship of education 
uh, in the field of geriatrics and gerontology and um, research as it is implemented in practice. So it's applied in that way. So very much a gerontologist field of work. For Did you have any female mentors who impacted your move into gerontology? Well, I don't think they impacted my move into since I had this calling, you know, I just uh, wasn't going to do anything but. But uh, they did influence me in a lot of ways in giving me um, a vision of what I could do and mentoring me in many ways uh, around my presentation of myself and the linkages with other people and, and very much support. Uh, Rose Doboff is a very famous uh, gerontological social worker uh, in New York. I met her in some of my work with the GEC, um, the California Geriatric Education Center, because I continued to look at curriculum, and, and she really um, gave me a lot of opportunity and, and was a person very uh, much, as a, as a woman mentor, I had men mentors too, Jim Lovin and other uh, wonderful gerontologist, and so, but uh, Rose Dobroff was really um, the first uh, woman in the field of aging who, who really took me on, and I think some of that taking me on, <laughs> maybe it was a big job, um, was because I was older, you know, so I'm going back mm -hmm. into the doctoral program um, when I'm in my for late 40s, mm -hmm. and so everybody thought I already knew everything and should just go on about and do everything myself. And yet I was new to this profession um, at the academic level. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, I think, what um, I was frequently asked to mentor before I was you know, <laughs> minted. You know, so uh, that it, it was a little different course, and I think that was because of age. But Rose was 20 years older than me, and she saw <laughs> me as good grounds to begin mentoring, and, and she really did. Wonderful. What is unique about being a woman gerontologist? Well, I hadn't really thought about that, but I think women have a particularly embodied uh, awareness of the life course, you know, and so this moving the path, you know, from a baby to old age um, is somehow something that's just part of a, a perspective on life. Mm -hmm. So I think there is something natural about that. And of course women are involved a lot in caregiving across the life course to very different degrees and very different paths that women have, increasingly diverse path for women. Uh, and still I think there is some, this, there's something embodied about understanding change and transition and development and um, the context of that development. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. How has being a gerontologist interacted with your, your own personal aging process? Well, I'm just right in it now. Um, and I always thought that it was important to um, not distance oneself from one subject matter. That age is something we carry. It's, as Herman Feifel, a thanatologist, that it's in our gut just like death. Mm -hmm. we, we are that material. That's what's happening to us. And in my classes, I would uh, be out <laughs> about my age, whether that was 40, which was still young. I did a lot of teaching with freshmen at UCLA, and so whatever age I, I was, I uh, put that as subject matter, you know, at, in that it was an intergenerational um, exchange. So that was, kind of a, to some degree, an awareness uh, across my teaching that I'm part of the subject and that they are part of the subject, and I really worked on I did one of my favorite things that I ever got was the Distinguished Teaching Award at UCLA. And that was, part of that was seeking relevance always. So that in teaching aging and 
getting freshmen involved in taking a year-long class in aging as one example, it was really important for them to not see it about old people over there, you know, but their own aging, their family's aging, the demographic of aging, you know, things that were happening right now and that were hot material that were really changing rapidly. So, so I think back to your question about my own aging, how it's affected that. I think I worked on that over time with this, but that's not true of all faculty. I've taught with people who would never mention their age and, you know, really kept that as, as something quite separate. But I think it made it easier for me because I, I didn't. And I'm out about my age now. I'm 71. I was 71. And so I've been retired maybe, I'm not really retired, but Helen Dennis uh, is a, a gerontologist at USC and she writes about women uh, and retirement. And she doesn't call it retirement, she calls it renewment. So I'm in renewment <laughs> and I like it. And I still write a lot. I still am here at Augie presenting the competencies and so on and so forth. So it, it is in a dichotomous transition from one world to another world. It's kind of a path that I keep some of that, but I do some very new things. I'm into art, mixed media. So, I mean, so it's, it's a very uh, interesting, and I think particularly a time of potential of developing parts of ourselves that we've kind of left behind along the way, as well as keeping parts of ourselves that we've uh, been able to develop through our, whatever work we engaged in and our, our experience. So it's, been, it's informed me a lot, gerontology and my age. The Wiggle Project focuses on the legacies of older women gerontologists. So within that framework, is there anything else you'd like us to know? Say the first part of the sentence. This project is focusing on the legacies of older women gerontologists. So, okay. um, well, I think I too, like Rose Doboff and others who have mentored me, um, really also mentored, and I think that's a legacy. I mean, I just love love hearing from students who are far and wide and I just heard from a woman, Margaret Moon, who was a geriatric psychiatrist. Now that was such a long path from when I knew her as a freshman at mm -hmm. UCLA. Yeah. You know, a lot of steps in there and now she's married and has a baby and so um, as well as having probably one of 12 <laughs> geriatric psychiatrists. I mean, it's a very select field, very few people go in specifically into that. We need many, many more of them. So just that she's just one example, but I have you know, lots of people that, uh, Maria Claver and uh, Cal State Long Beach who heads and directs that internship and study program, and lots of people who keep touch from Kayo and Japan and Taiwan and uh, Korea, and, you know, and, and it's just wonderful to hear the courses they're developing and, and the things they're doing. So uh, I could name many, many more. Sorry, I left out lots of people, so I'm not going to go through the whole list. But and it's not a big list, but mm -hmm. it's a significant list to me, you know. So that I think has been a big part, and I think I don't know that this would be any different. If I was, you know, I don't think it's gender specific. Uh, I mean, I think there's some gender sp specificity to the mentoring because I think I, I particularly uh, mentored women who were interested in fully having a life <laughs> as well as an academic career because I have three children, six grandchildren. I mean, you know, I, I had a life. Um, and uh, I mean, not that that's all of life. Is, Procreation, but it, it was a part of my life and a big part. So um, it was that I think, and many of the people was important that they saw me uh, as fully living a life uh, as a woman, and also succeeding 
to the degree that I have in an academic life. And sometimes that's when you're in the doctor program. Uh, may seem like wait, there, there's nothing outside of that life, you know. So I think it it was was very much part of the mentoring. Uh, but I think legacy-wise, that uh, I've also left a legacy in the education of um, future generations and developing curriculum, and uh, particularly uh, Nancy Hoyning called me the grand dame of competencies that um, that I've really focused on doing that and made a contribution to other health professions, certainly social work and, and certainly gerontology itself. So hopefully those will change and grow, but you know, that I you know was part of planting a seed in, in that direction.